Hi, I'm Jake Burns and uh, I've just popped up to do a, a little uh, video thing as a, a thank you to the National Health Service for helping everybody get through these uh, remarkably dark days that we're living through at the moment. I'm just going to play a couple of songs and answer some questions that uh, people have been kind enough to, to send in. And in fact, there was uh, one here, where are we? It's in here somewhere. And it's to do with, yeah, it's to do with the first song I'm going to play, and it's from uh, Stuart Ronald. And he asks if uh, I knew the positive impact that the song My Dark Places was going to have on the number of people that are suffering from mental health issues. See, I just touched my face there. You're not supposed to do, do that. See, that's, that, was, that was not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, I... Uh, I basically wrote the song for myself because I suffer from depression myself and um, it was, uh, I wrote it more as a, just an aid, aid memoir as they say, um, just to remind myself that there was light at the end of the tunnel and uh, that was uh, why uh, I wrote the song, I didn't actually write it, um, expecting anybody to hear it, I, I originally didn't want to record the song but uh, the rest of the band were very keen to do so and I'm glad we did. Uh, mainly because, as Stuart's pointed out, a lot of people um, have actually said that the song helped them. So, uh, with that in mind, this is the song. This is a song called My Dark Places. Well, it cuts just like a knife, takes away your love of life, puts out your fire and leaves you in the ashes. you love now leaves you cold. It's hard to get the strength to be some more Some days you really feel like I am. Some days you swear you'll never go out anymore. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to my dark Around to answering some of these questions. Let's see what we got. Um, first one is from somebody called John Birch. I'm not sure where you are, John, because I wasn't given that information. So, uh, anyway, John asks When you did the HMV in store DVD signing in 2007, 
was the live show ever recorded. It was the most intense SLF gig I ever intended, and the atmosphere was electric in such a small venue. Well, blimey. First of all, I'm not sure which HMV stores. We did do a bunch of them, um, but probably the one in London, the one in Oxford Street, I think. Or was that a virgin? Oh. Um, anyway, uh, really, <laughs> electric, honestly. Uh, okay. No, it wasn't actually recorded. Um, and uh, that's kind of bizarre that the best gig you ever saw us do was in a shop. But, um, you know, it just shows we don't muck about, get on a stage, we, we're there to do it, whether it's in a shop or, you know, at, uh, at the Barrel Land or whatever. But anyway, sorry, we didn't record it. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Adrian Clark asks Have I and Henry ever met since uh, he parted ways from the band? Yes, we have. We've met a few times. Um, uh, he happened to be passing through Chicago on one occasion and we met up and uh, had a couple of drinks. Well, I had a couple of drinks. Henry doesn't doesn't drink. So uh, well, we spent uh, an afternoon in a pub. So I'm doing it again. I keep touching my face. You know, it turns out that's everybody's favourite pastime. Uh, nobody knew. So, yeah, and, you know, he uh, he's popped up at a couple of shows. We've been on the same bill a couple of times. We saw we met each other. I think last time we actually saw one another was at uh, Rebellion a few years back in Blackpool. So, uh, yes, we have. Uh, we have seen each other. Right, Colin Venucci asks, do I think I'll ever come home to Northern Ireland to live when I eventually hang up the guitar? Uh, never say never. Uh, I mean, you can see behind me, I've still got uh, memories of home no matter where I am. Uh, it's one of the strange things. I mean, I, I left Northern Ireland when I was 20. 20 years old. I'm 62 now, so you know I've lived most of my life away from the place. But you know, like like I think for most people, wherever you're born and, and your formative years are, it's always home, no matter where you've lived. I mean, I've lived in I lived in London, I've lived in Newcastle, and I've been in Chicago now for the past 15, 15 and a half years. So you know, uh, but yeah, there is something special about about Northern Ireland. It's, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's the place that made you, you know. Um, whether I'd ever go back and live there, like I said, never say never, but uh, at the moment, you know, uh, this is, America's my home, it's where I've lived for a long time, and uh, I don't see, uh, I don't see another move outside the country, I don't think, in my future. But, uh, but like I said, you never know, you never know. Hang on a second. All right, what else have we got? Hayden Wrigley asks, do we have any unreleased tracks or demos or have we literally recorded everything you've ever written? Uh, we've recorded everything we've written. <laughs> um, uh, I think there are, there are one or two songs from way, way back in the day. There was a Henry song that was recorded for the first album that didn't make the cut. Um, but I don't think there's been anything since then. There might have been, but I don't think there has. Um, I'm racking my brains trying to think. No, I can't think of anything. I mean, the only things we haven't recorded are sort of the new, the brand new songs. And uh, Hayden goes on to ask, uh, are we going to release 16 shots, um, which we've been playing for a couple of tours recently? Yes, I mean, eventually the, the idea is to. Um, record another Stiff Little Fingers album at some point. Um, I know I'm not the most prolific songwriter in the world. Uh, used to be, but th back in the, that's one of the reasons we don't have any unreleased materials because literally everything we wrote back in the day was put out because we were on such a, a tight schedule. I mean, those were the days of, of you know, album tour, album tour, album tour. And uh, uh, that, that was, you know, we were on that same treadmill as, as every other band, really. So, yeah, I mean, and, uh, to be honest with you, there's, there's there's something to be said for that in so much as it forces you to work. But equally, you know, I think looking at uh, our output, there are a number of songs that I don't think would have made the cut if we'd had the luxury of, of being able to spend a bit more time, um, you know, between between albums. Um, but yes, 16 shots along with uh, the other songs that we have been playing, like The Lights of Tilting at Windmills and Here There's No Home Here, those... Uh, and there are a couple of others kicking around that haven't gotten as far as those those three yet, but yes, the idea is at some point uh, to to record another album. Um, right, going on. Craig Wilson, do you think Rudy were an underrated punk band from Ireland? Yeah, I do. 
um, they had some great songs. Uh, the thing about all the bands that, that we saw and we knew growing up in in Belfast at the time, and the people we, we interacted with, I mean, bands like Rudy, who we were probably closest to, we probably saw them the most, um, and the Outcasts as well. Uh, the Undertones we didn't really come into contact with because they, I mean, I'm just talking about three, the three main Belfast bands that, that, that we knew. And... Uh, like all of us, I mean, well, Rudy had some really good songs, um, but also like the, like the, you know, like the Outcasts and like ourselves, uh, we were all very Rudy Mandarin musicians. We were very basic, and uh, you know, we all we all got by on on enthusiasm rather than than actual sort of you know, musical ability. And and I think that a lot of those bands, I think because the spotlight got turned on us very quickly, um, you know. John Peel, God bless him, picked up on on our first record, and and then he picked up on uh, Teenage Kicks, uh, and I think suddenly it was almost like you know record labels wanted to have a band from Northern Ireland on the label, and uh, so as a consequence, which I think before uh, the bands really had a chance to grow into the, into themselves, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of interest and a lot of of, of sort of. You know, spotlight put on on these bands and and you know they just I, I don't think ourselves included i don't think we were really ready for that at that time so you know i think that yes rudy were very much an underrated band um and, and i think it's a shame that they didn't uh, get the breaks that that they definitely did their songs deserved um because it would have been interesting to see what they're going on to do i mean i know brian is doing the saber jet stuff and i think ronnie is the, the other guys are just kind of you know packed up playing all together, which is a shame, but, uh, you know, all that stuff was a lifetime ago, really. Um, okay, what else have we got? Uh, who would you make your all-star punk band to do a one-off gig with you? What you mean, apart from the lads I normally work with? <laughs> um, wow, let's see. Uh, well, it'll have to be people that I actually get on with, I suppose. Um, in the main, uh, so I mean, of all the, like I said, I'm I'm making an exception for the guys in the band because I, I really wouldn't want to replace any of them, um, just simply because you know, I, I, you know, apart from the fact we are all friends, I genuinely do admire them all as as musicians. Um, so, but leaving that to one side, uh, on drums I would I probably want. Mr. Ruffy, Dave Ruffy from the Ruts, um, not just for the you know his play and his play is is phenomenal. But I, I could he's the only drummer I can think of I could watch play drums all day. I mean he just makes the whole thing look so so effortless. It's 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 fantastic. It's fantastic. Just to stand at the side of the stage and watch Ruffy play is 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 a, you know it's an entertainment in itself. Um, bass guitar. I'd have to go for uh, for Mr. Burnell, you know, for JJ. Um, again, you know, the minute you hear one note played by the guy, it couldn't be anybody else. So, you know, that's that to me is, is the mark of a of a great a great player. That uh, you know, the minute you hear the one note, it could be you know, anybody else. And you know, in in terms of both of these guys, they are good friends of mine, and and, and I think there would be a lot of fun to be had playing with them. Uh, would I want a second guitar or a keyboard? That's that's a thing. I mean, I've worked with second guitar uh, all the way through stuff. I think as well. Obviously, there was key, there were various keyboard players in the in the big wheel time. And the keyboard thing is always a fun aspect. Um, you know, I don't I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I, the thing is, I'm such a basic guitar player. I guess I'd want somebody. Let's stick with second guitar because let's stick with stiff little fingers sort of style. Um, I would want somebody that that could be a bit more adventurous than me, I suppose. So, you know, probably somebody like like Mike Dimkich from from Bad Religion, who's a, a ridiculously good guitar player. Um, you know, or Brian Baker. Either either of the Bad Religion guys would would work remarkably well. And again, they're nice people, so I think it would be fun to do. That was an interesting question. Uh, Billy McShane asks, how gutting was it not to be able to play Barrowland on St. Patrick's Day? Um, 
you know, you probably know the answer to that one yourself. It it was it was horrible, but it was horrible to, to cancel the whole tour. But everybody knows the reason why. I mean, it's the reason I'm doing this this video now. Is uh, I don't think anybody knew the extent of what was happening at the end. I mean, it was just mass confusion at that point. Um, it felt like, I mean, cancelling any show is always hard for for anyone in a band. Um, but to cancel a whole tour was you know, unprecedented but then the situation was unprecedented and you know we felt at the time that we weren't being given we, we tried to wait and see what sort of direction we were going to be given by by the, the government and by uh, the health authorities and stuff and you know I'm assuming that the health authorities hands were tied but either way we didn't get any clear direction from from the government um, and at that point it just seemed like it would be foolish to carry on, it, it seemed like it wasn't in anybody's best interest. So it was a decision that we, you know, we just had to make. Um, but yes, it was, it was, it was very, very disappointing. And you know, now we're we're like halfway through or a third of the way through April when I'm recording this, and we still don't see any end in sight. Um, as things stand at the moment, we've got the Barrowland show organised for August the first, and I'm still hopeful that can go ahead but uh, at the moment all these things are up in the air so it was it was hugely disappointing at the time and uh, we just have to wait and see what happens uh, in the future but you know that 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 room and that audience brings a special sort of magic anyway so i'm sure it won't be too difficult to recreate st patrick's day in august i'm fairly sure that you know, that will happen um, uh, Gary Walker asks, there was a live album from Brixton Academy released many years ago called Fly the Flags. It was also going to be released on video, but that never happened. Is the footage still out there somewhere? Good damn question. I have no idea. Um, probably. But, you know, it'll be one of those things that'll turn up in somebody's garden shed in 50 years' time. And they go, who the hell are this lot? <laughs> so, sorry. sorry, Gary, I've got no idea, mate. Uh, Paul Garbutt, what is your favourite song by another artist? Ooh, that's, I mean, the one I always go to is White Man and Hammersmith Palais by The Clash, um, because it's it's kind of got everything. I mean, the lyric is phenomenal. The lyric is just out of this world. Uh, the the actual tune itself is is hypnotic. The power of the record is is incredible. Um, and I love the fact that it doesn't follow a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, chorus, chorus, chorus to the end uh, structure like a lot of songs do. It, it, the actual structure of it doesn't make sense. And, and that's part of, its, part of its magic, I think. I mean, it's, people always talk about, you know, you can't catch lightning in a bottle. I think The Clash very much caught lightning in a bottle with that song. I think it's a, it's a fantastic piece of work. Um, Kevin Rudd asks, where and when, how and where did you get your first guitar from? And did I consider playing another instrument? Actually, I did, the only musical tuition I've ever had in my life was I had a couple of months worth of drum lessons when I was at school. I think that's more and more apparent in my guitar playing that that's, uh, that's been the case. Um, but yeah, the first guitar came from like, probably like quite a few people, it came from Woolies, came from Woolworths. Um, it was a thing called an audition guitar. Um, which turned out now that they were actually a Japanese brand called Taisco or Taisco, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, T-I-S-C-O, which uh, according to the, the interweb are uh, much sought after. God alone knows who by because they were horrible things. Um, I mean the action on it was so high, it was it, you, could, you could use it to grate cheese with, it really wasn't much use as a as an instrument, but um, yeah, it was, it was a Woolworths guitar. And I remember at the time going in with my dad and he was like, so so, which one do you want? And they had two models. One had one, had one pickup in the middle and the other had like a, a, the standards with a neck and, and bridge pickups. And, and I could see from his face that he was not enamored by this idea at all. The electric guitar was not something that he wanted in a, a tiny little, you know, two up, two down in, in Belfast. Um, and I thought I best not push my luck here. And I think I think the two pickup uh, model was something like four quid more expensive, so I thought I'll just I'll, I'll go for the one pickup model. So I basically picked the worst of a bad bunch to start with, um, but uh, you know if nothing else it sort of tightened up your 
it tightened up your finger pads pretty damn quickly because it was like playing a cheese grater like I said um, Alison Miller asks what are your best and worst memories from living in Newcastle not football related thanks for the caveat there Alison that, uh, that actually lets me off the hook on a, on a lot because both the, the best and worst memories are indeed tied to the football club um, but leaving them to one side uh, I don't actually have any bad memories at all uh, of living in Newcastle. It was it was it was a wonderful. It is a wonderful city, and it's a wonderful place to live. Um, I mean, it's got so much going for it. the people. First of all, are are just wonderful, wonderful people. Um, incredibly friendly, incredibly welcoming. I mean, I've been lucky. I find that everywhere I've lived, um, the people are very friendly and welcoming. Um, and uh, but the, the 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 really magnificent thing about Newcastle is its location. I mean. It's you know it's a big, it's a major city it's it's a vibrant city it's got everything that that, that brings with it um, but equally you know if you drive five minutes in one direction you've got some of the most stunning coastline in the country and five minutes in the other direction you've got some of the most stunning countryside in the country so it it really is you know it's it's an idyllic place to live it's a wonderful place to live um, probably my favourite thing about living there was it was the first time in my life I lived somewhere that I could have a dog and uh, I'd always wanted to have a dog and in fact during my time I had two um, and both bulldogs wonderful wonderful animals uh, Gus and Wilf they were called and uh, those are you know I, I, I just really really loved living in the place I thought it was fantastic uh, just last couple of questions then uh, Cass Frieda Brown as for Cass Frieda Brown. Sorry, Cass. It's Cass Frieda, not Cass Frieda Brown. Because the question is brown or tomato sauce? Tomato sauce every time for Pete's sake. But, you know, I mean, there's a bottle of HP sauce in the cupboard over there that I, you know, I think somebody gave me just because it had a picture of the Houses of Parliament on it, and they thought I might be homesick. Quite why for the Houses of Parliament? I don't know. But there you go. And the final question is from Marianne Halls, who wants to know. Her husband actually wants to know why I changed from the Yamaha SG to the ESP I use now. Um, basically, uh, I find that the uh, I, I was having trouble keeping the Yamaha in tune. Uh, I don't really know. That was probably down to my appalling playing. Um, but I tried everything. I changed the machine heads on it. I changed. I mean, I had it set up and reset up, and it it just didn't like to stay in tune. And uh, the main attraction that the ESP held for me was it had a locking nut at the top of my neck, which meant it would stay in tune no matter how, how hard and, and ineptly I, I battered away at it. So uh, those were uh, that was that was the main reason. Then of course you know by the time I got it, the guitar technology it's a very simple instrument. The guitar there's not much to it. It's just a plank of wood with wires and and and, th and that's it really. Um, but pickup technology had moved on so much that the guitar was just so much more responsive and uh, so much more powerful uh, and, and got close to the sound that I had in my head. So uh, from that point on, I've, I've played ESPs and been, been remarkably happy with them. Uh, so that's the answer to that, then, really. All right, final song. Uh, I, I kind of got to play this one. Uh, it's... Uh, it was a song that was originally written, most people know this story, but it was a song that was originally written to be given away with uh, a fanzine. It was going to be a, a flexi disc for a fanzine. And uh, the fanzine was called Alternative Ulster, which is where I took the, the title from. Um, and uh, luckily for us, uh, Gavin Martin, who owned and, and ran the fanzine, uh, didn't think much to the song, so we got to keep it. Um, so. Thanks, Gavin, because, you know, giving it away would have been a bit foolish, so.